I am Neil Atkinson. I'm joined by Philip Smallwood, Steve Graves and Ian Ryan to talk about where Liverpool are up to in general, but also a conversation about uh, Euro 2021. Uh, that is to come now that we know the last four. We will get up onto that. But I want to start off with a general sort of taking of a temperature. It was intriguing to me that Kevin Palmer happened to tweet something this week and I saw the sort of ramifications of it. And I don't like discussing stuff that's sort of social media based a lot of the time. Uh, but his, 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 his thing described uh, Haaland to Chelsea, uh, Kane and Grealish to City and Sancho to Manchester United and said in Liverpool don't seem to uh, have, a, a, have an ability to be able to be interested in that sort of stuff. Now, three of those four things hadn't happened and still haven't happened at the time of recording. And um, what isn't mentioned within there is that we'd spent £35 million on a centre-half. But I think that the, the point, Steve without getting into the sort of the intricacies of this, it is very valid to point out that of those things, even the ones that haven't happened and the one that has, it's to, it's perfectly reasonable to surmise that things like that will happen. Manchester City are going to go very big on two forwards slash attacking midfielders, I think it's fair to say. I think they almost have to. Um, I think Chelsea will buy a centre forward. It may well not be Haaland. I'd actually be surprised if it was. Um, and Manchester United have bought Sancho and look like they are going to be looking at Rafael Varane. Um, that does look like a thing that's happening. And I think, it's for me, first and foremost, it is just a reminder that the size of the challenge isn't breaking 86 points, which is what Manchester City got last season. It's breaking 95 points, and that's the way in which it's been. Yeah, it's breaking 95 points so that you just yeah you just blow any of those moves out of the water really I, I mean th- there's so much scope for all of those moves to not work out in any way the, the way that the 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 people signing off on them would assume that they will we've seen it countless times with with footballers who look like the, the sort of the final piece of a jigsaw or the, or, the, or a magic bullet signing for for x team and it, and it doesn't work out including we, liverpool. we all know that including liverpool from you know from stan collymore onwards i guess um that you think that you know, now they've done this. That's gonna that's gonna solve X, and and you, know, you, you just look at their points total from last season, and you add twelve to it, and you go, God, that's scary. But there's all kinds of there's all kinds of factors at play. With you know, you, you say with City have to. Well, well, yeah, of course they do because their totemic forward has, has gone. Um, now he didn't play as much, but he, you know, still a huge loss in 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 their squad. So that they they're gonna have to sign somebody. And it's pretty unlikely they're going to sign somebody from from League One, or, or you know, <laughs> they, they're going to go out and they're going to buy the best that they can get because they need to. I think you could take a sort of hyper rational approach and say that Liverpool have have looked to address in a similar fashion the the obvious thing that they should look to address, which is as brilliantly as Nat Phillips and Reese Williams perform at the end of last season, Liverpool don't want to start the season with. Those those footballers as as their as their two centre halves. I mean that 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 I think is is, is fairly you know is is fairly uncontroversial. Um, what Liverpool do next? I, th- I think I think it's not so much about the the bare facts of it that Liverpool aren't quite in the race to compete for those massive names and those massive transfers. I think it's what people think that means, which is either that. They always assume that the manager agrees with them, which is that he would love to have Harry Kane in next week. Um, and I don't think that's the case. And that it reflects something like lack of ambition or... They, they may be valid and they may be right, but I don't think they naturally follow as as arguments to say that if Liverpool aren't outbidding Manchester United for Jadon Sancho, that means that Liverpool are essentially going, yeah, we're going to carry on finishing behind Man United and we're fine with that. I think it's way more, it's way way more complicated than than people would would like it to be. I guess um, I'd you know I'd, I'd love us to be in the market for for Sancho. I think in particular, I, I, I think they can keep Harry Kane as far as I'm concerned, just in terms of the style. I, I don't I don't see it being a, a natural fit for us. But yeah, Sancho, you you really could see. But then then you're saying that you are essentially going to have to find a slot for him ahead of the four forward players Liverpool have got, all of whom I think are brilliant. And I think that's that's really hard to work out exactly where you know again Manchester United clearly need to do what they're what they're looking to do. Whether Liverpool do, we'll, I guess we have to wait and see. But but Liverpool getting back the players they are getting back um, and keeping play. I think what we forget is that I think in in the normal flow of things, one of the front th- three surely there would have been some kind of transfer kerfuffle around in the last couple of seasons. I'd say. 
had had things been you know not as abnormal as they have been, and that is a big factor in why Liverpool might not be in in the market necessarily to to replace them right now. We can. I think Sancho's interesting in how Steve frames it there, Ian, in that it's very easy to see literally which position he plays for Manchester United <coughs> from minute one. Uh, he's going to come in, he's going to play off the right, uh, maybe occasionally behind the forward in a 4-2-3-1, but you don't see him ousting. Fernandez. he might do a little bit off the left if they want to do some jiggery-pokery, but he comes in and is effectively um, becomes their fourth option uh, who will start. And it is valid to say that Liverpool obviously aren't um, on around that. The flip side, though, is that <coughs> It's reasonable to have concerns about the squad with the challenges that are in front of them, that are going to come. And it's also reasonable to have concerns around the squad on the idea of the ages of some of these players. What doesn't help Liverpool is of the front three, they all they may well all approximately have the same birthday. And what that means is at some point you need to, there does need to be a replacement process. And I, I, I take Steve's point around the transfer kerfuffle around one of the three of them. I wonder if somewhere in Michael Edwards' big book of long-term planning, he almost would have quite liked one transfer kerfuffle around the three of them to have happened by now in that he could have cashed in and gone, right, these are the two we move forward with. We replace that one with two other younger lads, we, of which one could be Sancho and go from there. But that's how Liverpool have to operate. They can't operate in a, in a sphere like Manchester City. Yeah, I think just to take your points on United in terms of Sancho, the narrative always seems to be, well, it's fine because Solskjaer is there. There'll come a point when Solskjaer is not there and they'll still end. And whoever comes in, I would expect it to be a much higher level than Solskjaer and they're going to be left with one hell of a squad, potentially. Uh, I still think there's things that need to happen back four, um, maybe goalkeeper as well if you're United, but Sancho's a, it's a hell of a signing. Um, I think it's a hell of a sign. It's a hell of a sign. And I think the frustration for, say, me and, and probably lots of other Liverpool fans as well, I understand it's a balancing act and you've got to get that balance right. It does seem that we're never really in the conversation for these top players. And I think it is frustrating because you, you win a league title, you win a European Cup. Obviously, the COVID thing does skew everything. You've got to factor that in. But when these big hitters become available, you would like it if Liverpool were part of the discussion. But- so the, the, if the, if they're sat here now, they go and watch Thiago Alcantara. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think I think that's a fair comment. But I think you know Thiago Alcantara. I think because of the price, that almost the age and the age that kind of plays into what Liverpool want to do. Not necessarily the age thing, because we know they've got a certain kind of profile of player. But I think it was a world class footballer coming on the market who the manager knew. And he was of the right price, and he could do a little bit of a diddle in terms of you know last summer. They go and do, I think broadly speaking, what people want them to do in terms of the areas they filled. You can have a conversation about centre half and could they have done a little bit more there. Um, but they end up paying for those players in a certain way and they end up being able to structure them in a certain way, which allows yeah. them to do those deals. I think the frustration lies when a, a Grealish, for instance, or you know a Haaland comes on the market and Mbappe, dare I say it, you know, are Liverpool going to be in that conversation? And I would. I'll probably say no. Now, maybe the Mbappe thinks different if he ends up going on a free and you can do something fancy with the payments in terms of his salary. I still wouldn't think we'd be in the conversation, to be honest, but, you know, let's see what happens on that one. So I think that's where it lies, Neil, for people. You know, you see these big players moving and you you wish that maybe Liverpool could be in there for them. I think what I always come back to is, thank God we've got the manager we've got because without Jurgen Klopp, I do find it difficult to, to paint a picture that says Liverpool are going to be challenging because we're not maybe in that place where we can invest as heavily as one or two other teams. And that's been the case for a while, but because of the manager we've got, because of the skill set he's got, he's able to get more out of the players than, say, probably anyone else. I can't think of another manager in world football who could do the job that he's done. You know, you put Jürgen, you put Pep Guardiola in charge of Liverpool on the budget, Klopp said, he's not getting the same return. He's probably not winning the league title. He's probably not winning but He's probably not winning the European Cup because he can't win one with all the money he's got at Man City. So I always come back to, thank God, the manager's here. But when the manager leaves, and we know it's a few years off, yeah, you would worry. On the the way that works with the, the challenges, Philippa, this is where, for me, you know, there's the, the, I'm, I'm intrigued by discussions at the minute because everybody thinks we need another centre mid, and I agree, by the way, and, and as part of this whole conversation, I think people should be excited about transfers. I'm not cynical about it. I don't think it's I don't think it's a mad thing to do, and I would 
well, I was about to say crawl over broken glass for Barella. Uh, I would... I would go through a, a salt course that would cause me a moderate amount of pain if it meant that <laughs> Liverpool would sign uh, Barella uh, to come and play in the heart of our midfield. I think he's fabulous. Whenever I caught him last season, I thought he was fabulous in the Euros. I think he's been fabulous. And this is my point. My point is that Liverpool have got seven lads who would describe themselves as centre midfielders and you don't think they've got enough centre midfielders. And there's a point where, for me, that just gets a bit mad. That, you know, you can't... And this is the what concerns me about the squad is that... I think it's perfectly valid for Liverpool supporters full stop to be able to look at two or three areas and actually put a bit of a question mark over it. How will the centre-halves come back? Have we got enough centre midfielders? The trajectory of the form of Firmino and Mane, all of these things are legitimate for people to be nervous about. They are, but I think... I mean, I've got concerns all throughout the side, um, but I think if we was to address every single one of them, we would be bringing in 10, 12 players and I think that can also be detrimental to a side. I agree. Um, I I don't think major surgery is required. Um, I would have liked us to have been in the Sancho picture, but it's not just the transfer fee that we need to think about. It's the salaries. And if you know, we're led to believe that Sancho's coming, well, going to United on two hundred and fifty, three hundred thousand pounds a week, even three fifty, I think. Yeah. So it's a lot of money, and then. You know, he would come in, he would have been demanding that sort of money from us to to be able to come to us. And then you've got the issue of Mane, Salah, Firmino, literally Fabinho, every, Alisson, Van Dijk, three Van contracts Dijk, that are. Yeah. Exactly, all knocking on the door and going, hang on a minute, he's not done anything for us yet. You've signed him on this mega wage. You know, where's my extra? You know, I've helped us win trophies over the past few years. So it's not just as straightforward as saying we should be in... in the conversation for these players it's about being smart as well and I totally get people being nervous about other teams signing these stars because that's what they are um for me it's I think we just have to be a bit smarter like when we signed Mane like when we signed Salah um you know we then went big on Allison and uh, Van Dyke because we managed to get the money for for Coutinho um it's it's about finding the talent but maybe not at the prices that those megastars um are at um and they are out there it's just unearthing them it, you know for instance you can make an argument around eg signing Grealish two seasons ago you, you know that's yeah. you, you can you can sort of do that but what i would say philippa though is that sometimes it does like for instance i think the pl- part of the plan in liverpool this is the one thing that happened one of the many things that happens last season but one thing that happens last season that you can't just sort of shrug off or shake off though maybe we do see a bit of it last or sort of eight to ten games when you do sign a deserved mega star my point being not someone who's just been built up someone who's actually got it and first day of training's got it there was all this all that was the noise around Alcantara yeah and then he gets the injuries that he gets starts slowly ish now you begin to see it towards the end of it my point though is that I think it raises everyone a little bit it makes everyone feel good and there will be Manchester United players who are bouncing back into the first day of training and thinking, Jaden Sancho, we're on here. This is now serious. We're trying to win this title. We're giving it everything that we've got. Liverpool Liverpool can pull all the tricks that they've pulled. They've got the manager. They've got the players returning. But there is a lot to be said for first day of training. I can't wait to see him. Yeah, yeah, I totally get that. I totally get the buzz around getting a new player in a new um, toy a new toy yeah um you know a new focus in a in a way um it's just really difficult isn't it because we we know that with everything that's happened over the past 18 months that it is very very difficult for teams that don't have this you know massive pool of money that you know it's really really difficult to be able to justify doing the things that that Man City, you know, PSG, who've brought in so many players this this summer, you know, mega stars that you just think, you know, how can we compete with that? And, you know, with the way that we're set up and the way that we go about things, we just cannot afford to, like, just splurge £150 million on one player. The, the worry, Ian, about trying to be the smartest people in the room and that's what what I do think Liverpool do try to do, and Klopp is part of that. It's worth saying both Klopp, the recruitment of Klopp, and then Klopp's involvement in that, and then the way in which everybody works. I've noticed that Ian Graham's doing a couple of talks uh, in the near future because he's very innovative in the field. The worry about constantly trying to be the smartest people in the room is the ramifications when you're not. 
um, and not having those extra gears to fall back on. You know, that said, Liverpool, I think, finished third last season because it, things couldn't have gone any worse. But as we get closer and closer to the end of the season, the fact that Liverpool have got better players than everybody else around them uh, in Leicester, in Tottenham, in Everton, uh, I would also argue in Chelsea, helps massively because that's ultimately what it comes down to. It's the lads on the field. But if you are constantly relying on being smarter than everyone else, one summer, two summers of not being smarter than everyone else can kill you. Yeah, I think you saw a little bit of that with maybe, if you want to go back to kind of Arsene Wenger's time at, at Arsenal, where he, he was the smartest person in the room, him and his team, because they were bringing in players that, that no one else really knew about. But obviously football's moved on now, and those those kind of secrets aren't really there. You know, everyone knows everyone. But you're right, Neil, yeah, the, 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 there could be times where Liverpool's hit rate just isn't as good, because you would have to say, you know, it has been pretty good in terms of the players they've brought in. There's not been that many misses, um, but there has been there has been one or two. So, so yeah, it's difficult, and I think... You know, sometimes you've got to try and freshen the squad up, and it may mean losing one or two good players. So, you know, Genie Wijnaldum's gone out the door, and if you were asking me whether I would have kept Genie, I, I probably would have wanted him to stay because I think he's a really good player, and he's played, you know, ever so well for Liverpool over his time. But we have run him into the ground a little bit, and I can see why maybe the club have looked at it and thought, well, his legs are going to go soon, so he can go on someone else's watch. But if you're going to do that, I think you've got to go and replace him. I don't think you just let him go out the door and think, well, we'll just manage with what we've got. So the fear would be, you know, last season we went into the the campaign with, you know, we were light on centre halves, but you think, well, you might get away with it. I don't want to see a scenario where Liverpool are trying to get away with it again in certain areas of the pitch. And it might come down to that. So what if they got maybe seven midfielders currently at the club that you'd maybe call first team midfielders and probably five or six of them have got question marks over them in terms of their injury record. And I include the captain, who's brilliant, by the way, and he was brilliant when he came on for England last night. But he's got a question mark. Fabino picks up more injuries than you, more injuries than you think. He does indeed. Um, and then you've got you know Thiago, who's had injury worries in the past. Um, it's all them but Jones, and he just happens to be yeah, twenty. Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> and, frankly, and, and it is, it is, and, <laughs> and we know the Kaiser. That's not time to get them. We know the Kaiser and Chamberlain thing is a, is a massive issue. And I probably, and I'm on record of saying this, I would have moved on probably one, if not both of them, a little bit sooner. And I, and I like both of them in terms of what they can do on a pitch if they're fully fit. But the problem is getting them fully fit. And that's been an issue for a number of years now. Ian says there, I think it's interesting, he would have moved on one or two of them a little bit sooner. I think in, in, in the summer of 2019, Steve, they decide to grit the teeth and they're running with the lads that they've got after winning the Champions League and there's a league title to go and win. And I think that they decide that. But part of that is Klopp. Klopp's strengths... What I, I'm trying to sort of drive at here is that I think there's probably been one major flashpoint that gets resolved pretty quickly uh, whilst Klopp's been Liverpool manager around him effectively forcing a player out and it's Mamadou Sacco. Everybody else, you feel as though Klopp tries to create an atmosphere where everybody can contribute. The flip side of that, though, is right now I'm looking at all the stuff sort of linking certain players away uh, and then simultaneously saying certain players might want to stay. Klopp, it's very difficult if you build that sort of collegiate, we're all in it together atmosphere. You can't then pick someone and go, right, you're trading on your own until you're sold. Yeah. That's not what Klopp's about, and it's not going to be. Yeah. Liverpool all have, have got a history of quite liking a number of these lads, whether or not we feel as though they're contributing with what we see on the pitch in terms of how they are around the dressing room and all of that sort of stuff. But what that means is that right now, if Liverpool do want to know where they are in the market, who they're getting short of, etc., etc., that can't be done basically by being knobheads about it. You've got to almost have an organic process, and that'll take longer. Yeah, you're at, you, the atmosphere makes it seems to make it really hard to, yeah, to force people out. Really, um, you know, the, you, footballers who we've barely seen. You know, Simicas seems to really enjoy being at Liverpool, and it's a bit odd because you think, why would you know? Why would you surely wants to play football um, in front of crowds? In front, yeah, I and mean, like you know, and, and Origi, you know, you think well. Surely now you feel like you, you, the manager, you know, just enough times has not fancied you. But I think firstly you think you'd be entitled to think and you'd be right to think that there'll be a time again when the manager does fancy you again. Um, you know, see Shakiri's sort of mini renaissance in the middle of the season when suddenly he's seemingly the answer to every every sort of break glass moment, although it didn't quite work out. You know, he was a go-to off the bench time and time again. You suddenly you can come right back into favour, and the manager, I think, prefers to do that than to sign someone new. And I think he will always go with that. Maybe as part of that's the way that he's had to work, but I think he's also happy to do it. You know, I think everyone concluded after Real Madrid, Naby Keita is not going to get a look in again, and I don't think the manager thinks in those terms. I think he he thinks in terms of 
maybe he understands form more than more than many people do, and he understands what form kind of means and what is what is someone just being totally useless and you never want to see them again, and what is someone just having a difficult time for a while and you work to work around that. I think the way you need to, if you're going to work around that, I totally agree that you need more midfielders. Um, if you are going to say Alex Oxley Chamberlain, who I think has got a lot to offer and should have played more games for Liverpool last season, and I think when he, um, his contribution against Burnley, you know, it's one game, but it, but it, but it, for me, it felt like I'd like to see a lot more of that, and I think there is a lot more of that. Um, if you then also go with Naby Keita, who let's not forget was was the in the in fashion midfielder when we signed him was was a real coup to sign. I think you know you can you can say it's a misfire yeah. when you see how the the outcome. But it's the kind of signing we we are saying Liverpool don't make or we want them to make. Um, if you if you can get the best out of them, I think the only way you get the best out of them is is by buying at least one or two more who can consistently play. Um, so yeah, say Barella plus plus one more. Every side that's that's done really, you know, that, that's built uh, something in in this league has, has done it by starting with midfield um, by being overstocked there. Probably with lads who can do stuff in other positions. So Oxley Chamberlain. You know, can do a job for you in uh, um, in the front three, arguably even as a as a sort of attacking fullback. You've got um, a few of them who can do things in other positions, and I'd, I'd certainly be looking at that again to to replicate what we had with with maybe Milner for a couple of seasons, um, where you know, you could look at different roles or even different types, like like Van Alden could play six, eight, ten, played number nine at the new Camp. You know, you you could you could look at how you make that work, but. For me, yeah, centre mid is, is absolutely where we need to go next. But on that, I'll come back to centre mid in a minute. On that, and I'm just going to say that we just buy Barella and then we get on with our lives. Sam. But on that, um, there is, there is though, as I say, within this him, and this is where the manager himself, and this is where I think it is, it is a little bit difficult because because ultimately you're quite right in the players that you've mentioned. They should all, I'd, I'd include Shakiri in it, even off the back of what he's done last season and the fact that he's had a good Euros. Mm-hmm. Shakiri should be thinking, I want to go somewhere where I get 30 games. And I don't think Liverpool are necessarily overpaying these players. And in the past, Klopp said this line about he'd rather have an old, a hole than an arsehole. And I think part of the problem is he doesn't think of any of them like that. Yeah. And that, but in a sense, that's almost, as I say, at times like these, that's almost a little bit of a negative because Liverpool, we can all act as though the market's frozen. It's only just opened, Euros, etc., etc. And maybe Liverpool have began, began to get a sense of what they need to do. But they do have to empty out a bit of this squad. It is actually a bit more... Everyone keeps saying we haven't got depth. We have got depth. It's just that we don't particularly like our depth. It's yeah. a bit more bloated. We've got to get rid of the bloat, I'd say, Steve. And it, But it just doesn't seem as though we're going to absolutely force these people towards the door unless there's a lot of people knocking around at Anfield and Liverpool and the, the training facility who all play bad cop and Klopp <laughs> plays good cop. Yeah, it, it, I think he. I think he doesn't... I think probably from both points of both buying and selling... I'm not sure he enjoys it that much, and it is a process. No, I don't think he does at all. It's a process, you know, to get a deal for, for to get Harry Wilson off the books. Yeah. It's not a case of of click a button, Harry Wilson's on the market. Click accept when, but it used to be when Bournemouth came in with 15 million pounds. But you know, <laughs> but it, you can't just can't just do that. You have to have the negotiation with Harry Wilson with the other with the um, with the other side and all of that, and it takes time. And he's got six weeks. It's it's crazy. It's six weeks until the season starts. So he does, you know, if you do prioritise getting rid of them, yeah, I agree. And you don't want to sort of have to just go on and on with season after season when you've got depth that he's not going to use because, yeah, what what is the point? But at the same time, he's got to think about who is, who's going to start the first game and how, how are Liverpool going to look this season? What, what's, his, what, what's his tactical approach? He doesn't enjoy it, does he? And I suppose that's why... Maybe Edwards is there. Um, why that whole setup is there with with all with all of them? And it's maybe... in part why it works, but I think it's in part why it yeah. frustrates us at certain you, you, moments. You, you probably... there's, there's, there's tension. Things that are successful can also simultaneously be filled with tensions. I think he's happy to. You know, I I, I don't think he gives um, Jordan Ibe a huge amount of thought, but he loved Jordan Ibe when Jordan Ibe performed for him. I think he'd be happy enough if if some of that got taken away a little bit, maybe. And and you're right. He, what he doesn't want to do, he, it's it's not he's not Mourinho, and he's not going to want to. Um, Without there being a real reason that is that is non-football in his mind, um, then he's not gonna he's not gonna take on players. He's not gonna ostracise players. He's not gonna create an unpleasant atmosphere because he's gonna be here. He's not gonna you know I think you know when you're a, when you're a, when you're a manager who can just go all or nothing and go well I I won't be here anyway. I'll, I'll skip on to another job. If you are gonna be here in two three years, which we all hope he is, 
you know that what 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 do you create when you start creating that kind of atmosphere? In um in Mel Reddy's book, it was quite interesting when she talked about the process and the comparison between Brendan Rodgers, who wanted full control, compared mm. to when Jurgen Klopp walked through the door and he absolutely did not want full control mm. in terms of that process. Yes, he wanted to play a big part in it and have the final say, but the idea of him having to do that job that Michael Edwards does, absolutely not. You know, he didn't want to be, he wanted to train and coach the players and that was his role. And yes, he'd have a say on who comes through the door, but no, not at all like um, how Brendan Rodgers wanted it to run. So I think you're right, Steve, on that. I think when I talk about the likes of Keiter and, and, and Chamberlain, you know, I, I rate both of those players, mm. but it, it comes down to how much can you rely on them. And in Naby's case, it's going into his fourth season. I suppose they are hamstrung a little bit by circumstance now because because of COVID. How do you get some of these players off the books? You know, who's going to come and buy a player who's hardly featured in the last two, three, four seasons? You know, Divock Origi is another example where, you know, after the Champions League final, I think lots of people actually thought, not a bad time to sell Origi because his price is high. We give him a contract. We give him a contract. And, and now getting them off the books, you think, how are they going to do that? Because I can't imagine people knocking down Liverpool's door for Divock Origi based on what they've seen in the last 18 months. Two years, you're not you're not going to have people in the hundred. So therefore, now the narrative is being spun that Liverpool may keep him around. Well, they may have to keep him around because no one will take him, other than maybe a, a very very small amount of money. And Liverpool might think, well, you know, for that amount of money, is it worth selling them? So they're the kind of things they've got now got to juggle with. So they have been hamstrung a little bit with you know circumstance and and where we found ourselves in term, terms of how the world looks now. Um, but that as an excuse, you know, that'll only go so far if next season Liverpool don't start well and these question marks are still hanging over some of the players I, that we've talked about. As an excuse for a lot of people, I think it's run out, Philippa, and I've, I've got some sympathy with that as well. Um, I, Because for me, it's a philosophical point. I, I am firmly of the view that football clubs, broadly speaking, across three to five years, stretches should solely spend what they earn. That's what I believe, but there's a lot of people who don't believe that. There's a lot of people who believe that football clubs are vehicles, and literally some of these people will be on the crouch panel, let's be crystal clear. Uh, there are people who believe that football clubs are vehicles into which rich people should pour the money, and uh, football success should come out the other end. That's that's, And that's a valid viewpoint. It may not be one that I subscribe to, but that's a valid viewpoint. And this is, again, back to the gambles that you walk. I think part of Liverpool's success has been through a discipline around for instance you were, we were, we're, we're going to run the club this way it helps decision making it streamlines this it streamlines that when for instance Messi was mooted as being on a free 12 months ago Klopp straight away went well that's not our business we're not even going to think about that so we don't even need to make a decision it's done there's strengths to that but there are obvious weaknesses and if you're struggling to compete as Ian says if that happens next season because of the three things Grealish, Kane, Haaland and Sancho that all get mentioned if that's seen as part of it Liverpool, Liverpool's hierarchy will come under massive pressure to change philosophically and be about buying the best players quick. They will be. Um, I mean, obviously, so far, you would say they've been largely successful with the structure that they've set up at the club. Um, I don't think anybody can question that. Um, you know, there's the, as Ian said, you know, last summer, you know, the question mark about whether or not we signed another centre half, but nobody could foresee what happened last season. Um, there is this other thing as well where if we can't move on some of these players that you know we all quite rightly would probably look to move on this summer that there are only so many places within the squad and I don't think Klopp is the sort of person that would say right if we don't get rid of x y and z they're not going to play any part in my squad next season you know you can only have 25 players within this squad um there has to be a certain number of homegrown I think it's eight at the moment um I, I do wonder um, whether or not there's something there where we have to keep hold of the lights of Oxlade Chamberlain because I know I think you mentioned it before about you know he's maybe one that he would have looked to move on before now but he is a homegrown player and I think that is part of the reason why he's stuck around in Counts. the squad and you know I actually quite like him as a player I think it's a real shame what's happened to him in relation to the injuries and. You know, last season, I think a large part of why he didn't play more more for us is because he missed pre-season, didn't get that fitness work in, and then he's always playing catch-up throughout the season when he did actually manage to get fit. And I think, I think that's really difficult because the only way for him to actually then get that fitness is through playing games. But 
we were struggling at the point where he actually got fit again. So the Oxley Chamberlain thing, I think, Philip, just on that, is really funny. In that we're all knocking around thinking we need another goal scorer midfielder um, and somebody who can somebody who can score from distance. Like I would genuinely, I wouldn't have a problem if Liverpool went out and bought Deli Ali. Yeah. But what's the difference in the grand scheme of things? Genuinely, what's the difference? And I, so I think I, that's why I find the Oxley Chamberlain thing really funny. Yeah, I, but I think it's a good point as well what you said about the fact that he doesn't want assholes in the squad. Um, and part of what you know our strategy is in a way is to find out everything about the player before we bring them in and to find out if they will actually suit what we've got building here and I think somebody like Deli Alley um, maybe doesn't fit that but Oxlade Chamberlain does and if you're gonna I reckon it. Deli's sound you know he couldn't have got on under Pochettino yeah. for as long as he did if he's not sound I couldn't be fucking bothered working for Mourinho <laughs> you know what no. I mean if that becomes the bar Mm, well, I, I mean, you've seen what happened with Luke Shaw as well at United. You know, yeah. he was thrown under a bus by Mourinho and then he's he's come back and he's proved to be, you know, a really capable left back who's, you know, firing on all cylinders at the moment. Um, you know, Mourinho is one of those managers, but Klopp isn't. Klopp is somebody who will try and make everybody feel like they're part of the squad. The only exception to that was Sacco. Um, and, you know... We all know that there must have been genuine reasons mm. for that because he hasn't done that with anybody else. The due diligence is a thing with Liverpool, you know, in terms of who they bring in. They want to make sure they're not a knobhead um, because they want to make sure they are going to complement what, what exists already. And Neil, you know, I take your point around Dele Alli, but something tell, tells me that maybe he's not quite the trainer that you, that you want and that may be a factor. But the difference between him and Oxley Chamberlain, if you talk about them as players, one is pretty much always available to play and one isn't and that's that's the thing you come back to with Chamberlain it's not that he's not a good footballer and he can play multiple, multiple if positions if Chamberlain was here right now he'd be saying Ian I was in 40 match day know, squads last what, season lad I'd like him to pick me yeah which is fair <laughs> but guess what when you get picked and you get played you might get injured and he might have got injured by playing in those games because he's available he's not playing so He's had a lot of injuries during his time. Not as many as maybe people think, but he still missed a lot of football. And I think when you do start playing him, you know, there's a chance he might pull up and get injured. You might not see much of him. So, you know, he obviously wasn't anywhere near ready to play a lot of first team football last season. Because if he was, I'm sure Klopp would have used him. He's not a stupid man. If he was able to impact and affect things, I'm sure we'd have would have seen him a lot earlier. I think there was very much a case of he's had a really bad injury and we've got to get him over it and we've got to work with him and we've got to make sure he's okay before we put him back in. Because you did see him get dropped in now and again and he looked a mile off. Don't get me wrong, there's the Wolves game where he comes on and looks really good. But I think there were times where he just didn't look at so Liverpool have got to manage that um, and I think you know I always think or it gets referenced sometimes that Klopp's almost too loyal and maybe he is you don't know but then he's also got to balance the fact of if I get rid of this player am I going to be able to get a replacement in are the owners going to go and get me someone who is as good when this player's fit or can they get me someone better because they've got this balancing act with the with the books as well in terms of you know what they spend versus what they bring in and I think Neil you mentioned before you know in terms of you know, how people view the finances. When I look at it, I don't sit here thinking Liverpool should be playing fancy football. I don't think I'm being too demanding and thinking they should go out and sign all no. the best players. You can get silly about it. I don't think anyone's sitting here saying that. And when we talk about business coming in this summer, I'm not saying go and sign five or six lads. I think maybe two or three and you're, you're, you're where you need to be, to be honest. I don't think it's it's loads and loads of work that needs to be done. But you make the two or three count and they could but be big But the two or three have got to count and they've got to be relatively big hitters or they've got to be on that trajectory where you know they're about to go big and the numbers are maybe, you know, just going into double figures. But you're clever enough and you're cute enough and you've done your homework enough where you know they're going to go on a bit of a mad one similar to Mane and Salah and that's hard to get right by the way there's no there's no guarantees um, so I think yeah you're not sitting here thinking they've got to go and do stupid business but they have got to go and do business and when you hear things like we might not replace them around them and listen they put stuff out there no, they haven't got to tell us anything we always say that and even the local journals aren't always in the know because of how Liverpool structure things now so you've got to be you've got to be careful with some of that as well in, in terms of what gets spun out there but if they weren't to go and replace one album and they, if they didn't go and bring in another forward you, you would have legitimate concerns and I think that's fine I think with the Oxlade Chamberlain thing, I think this is a sort of slightly forgotten thing around the whole the impact of the centre halves is that he plays the front three and he plays the front three and he plays the front three and he's really fortunate that he's able to keep playing the front three. Um, well, fortunate or manages their fitness incredibly well um, off you know in training etc. Because I, I think I fell into this trap as well when you lose the two of them. I was happier then that we just find a way to get ten champion players if you like 10 elite players plus one who you have to carry 
and I think he didn't for different reasons you have to carry whether that's because they're Reese Williams and they're 17 and um, they're, you know, they're just starting out or they're Oxley chamberlain and you've got fitness concerns or they're Naby Keita and you've got fitness and form and, and, and all kinds of concerns potentially you just you just went for 10 plus 1 or 9 plus 2 at the worst of players who you know and you've seen and you've seen them win trophies and you know there's no there's no asterisk after them if you like there's and no, they all know each other there's no caveat there's no concern about starting the game with, with, with the front three who we know and love and if you put Oxley chamberlain in I think there was one there, were, there was a few times probably when it might have helped everyone had he got a bit more time on the pitch I think Curtis Jones similar um there's a there's a long run really where he just doesn't really get near after doing really really well early in the season. Um, there's quite a few players I think whose whose last season is is a result of a, the knock on effect of mm. of losing three top top class centre halves. I don't think it's just Van Dijk by any means. It's 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 all three of them not being available particularly later in the season. And then also just the imperative of of having to win every game, which you put yourself in that position to a certain extent. But once you're in it, you're in it. And and once you're losing one 0 at home to, to everybody, everybody, um, <laughs> you're in that game. You know, you, you you're trying all kinds of. I think there was times when he's just trying literally anything, and and that's that's good. You know, ultimately, I think he got there in the end with with exactly how it worked. But I don't think I don't think the manager initially responded, in, probably because we did all right for a while. I think then his response was was kind of had to be delayed, and it was it was really hard to work out. And I think. That's a big part of Oxley Chamberlain's last season for me. Okay, uh, Virgil looks great. Mm. Yeah, uh, loads of turning round. Yeah. That was the best bit. Yeah. Oh, he can do what he wants with the ball. He can yeah. head as much as he <laughs> likes. You just you just keep doing things he that will like him. Turn, turn round and, and and kick a ball while turning round. That's also pretty big. Yeah, uh, looks absolutely great. Uh, that is that. That's my main pro Liverpool takeaway of the last week. Uh, we're going to come on talk about the Euros in a minute. We've got three shows coming up, which is one extended conversation that went on for about three hours um, and. It's between um, Damien Cavana, uh, Peter Carney, and uh, Richie Greaves, uh, hosted by John Gibbons. Three, all three of them will be coming out for free. Um, it's around the aftermath of the final trial around Hillsborough collapsing and them being able to speak, um, which has obviously been difficult for survivors of Hillsborough. So all three of them, uh, three free shows coming out um, on Monday the 5th and Tuesday the 6th of July. A couple of things I'd say. The first thing is... You know, I think that the the excellent uh, listening and all three of them are remarkably generous uh, with the recollections and their experiences. Um, but you don't have to listen to them, uh, and I say that simply because they're very raw, very very honest. And if you don't feel in a place to listen to them, you're not letting the side down. And none of those three people would want you to think that if you decide that it's not for you either right now or not for you for the next couple of weeks, or even if it's just not for you whenever uh, this, there isn't a test at the end or anything like that. If you do listen to them, do make sure you are in a place to be able to listen to them, because as I say, they are very very raw and very very honest. Uh, all three uh, of the people on the show, uh, really really raw, honest recollections of everything that's happened, not just on that day or around that time but since then um, I think it's excellent listening and excellent broadcasting but the thing I'm not going to say which some people do say during times like this is that it is essential it isn't it really isn't so do all look after yourselves uh, around things like that uh, no matter what age you are what your previous experiences are and as I say uh, Damien Peter and Richie would want nothing less than that that you look after yourself in the context of them uh, that is to come they will all be out for free um, if you are going to share them with people um, which we would often with stuff we put out for free ask you to do on the Anfield wrap do do so but again be sensitive around that um, we do not need to necessarily absolutely uh, have anybody listen to this in any frame of mind um, but I will thank all three of them again and John uh, who does an excellent job with them as well uh, going right the way through it's three hours uh, we'll put them out as three individual one hour shows topped and tailed by John that is to come Monday the 5th and Tuesday the 6th of July um, the Euros then uh, we know the final four um, Ian three really interesting teams and stories in Spain <laughs> I know I saw you there Jen the little dig at Spain I mean they're yeah. just dull yeah, I mean they, they, they managed to be dull while scoring five goals that's some level of I dull I know it's not, it's not been a particularly great watch but listen they've found themselves in the semi-final and that's you know you can't do any more really um, I think lots of people wouldn't have fancied Spain to get as far as they have um, but you could say that about quite a few other teams that find themselves in the last four as well you know maybe England included um, who obviously you know, you've got to say they've done well Um but you know, maybe they've been helped by by the draw. But listen, that's the, the nature of knockout football. You know, you, you kind of you know you have to beat what's in front of you, and they've, they've beaten a, a, a German team that probably isn't 
as strong as old, but yeah. you've still got to go out there and do it. And we were chatting off there before. There's still some some big hitter names in that in that German team sheet. So, um, is it the most exhilarating football? Probably not. But but will anyone care if you're a, if you're a massive England fan and and they, they end up winning the, the tournaments? Just as you know, when we've watched Liverpool in the past under certain managers and they've brought the big silver thing home, you don't really care. So. I think Southgate, Steve, he's he's now taking England to two semi finals. I think I think he's tactically worked out international football quite well in that it isn't actually that hard. It's about getting a group of people into a certain mindset and that group of people might be a nation and he's done that quite effectively, or it's a set of players, and I think he's done that very effectively indeed. He's managing people brilliantly. He's not overcomplicating it. They're really, really well organised. And he's back in the fact that, for instance, Raheem Sterling is absolutely brilliant. He's back in the fact that I've got Jack Grealish on the bench and I can bring him on and I can change a game. It's five subs. I think he deserves a lot of credit, Southgate, for his clarity of approach and thought, while simultaneously saying that he would be a nightmare appointment conceivably for a Premier League side. Uh, that's absolutely fine. Some people have a skill set that suits a certain thing. And to me, he looks the man born to be England manager, not just right now, but for the next five or six years. Yeah, I think he, he he really has understood because he's been he's been in within this structure for a long time, you know, the sort of the England coaching structure, if you like. And I think he does really understand what it takes to to manage an international tournament, to get the best out of individual players, to manage the egos, to not to make tough decisions early on about some of the people that you're not going to take with you. Um, I think this is true also of Mancini at Italy, in that he made his big decisions early on, and then they're like a club team. Who meet every few weeks, or, yeah. you know, and and they they win together or they they lose together if they lose. But there isn't a sense of there aren't any egos, there aren't any people who uh, there's an awful lot of, of sort of noise on social media, you know, about X should be playing, Y should be playing, and obviously that's that's kind of died down now because he's he's, he's proven you know he's proven the case really. Um, they've not conceded a goal, and what they added against Ukraine was was. A, a real threat, um, you know. Albeit three, you know, three of the, go- the goals ahead is, you know, they're using set pieces really well. Um, I think he he deserves a lot of credit for for how he's obviously managed some of the, the stuff off the pitch, um, and and you know, spoken, not been afraid to to speak for his players and to back them. And you can, you know, in many ways, that whole controversy probably helped them and galvanised them um, around a common purpose. You know, obviously. Denmark have a common purpose which they would never have wanted, but but you can you can feel that in the way that, that that's pulled them together. Um, Italy have, have had the, the sort of endeavour of, of just never losing, and and some of them being um, players who Mancini has, has invested a lot of faith in and and sort of personal faith. Is reading about you know when he talks about Chiesa, yeah. he used to play with his dad and all of that kind of stuff, um, and they, they really respect Roberto Mancini. I think you know because. For some reason, you know, a really successful Premier League manager can be seen as a bit of a joke when when they don't quite live up to the the heights of success. And you know, someone slightly better comes in. I think he's still a very good manager. And then the Spain, um, and, <laughs> you know, the, the, a collection of footballers I, I, could prove me wrong by by scoring loads of goals in the semis and the final. But for me, like Danny Olmo, my limited experience of watching Danny Olmo play against Liverpool last season, you just thought it just looks miles off what you what you've seen from Spain sides. Um, and you know, unfair to just single him out, but you've got Morata, who is who is purely a finisher, who's not amazing at finishing, uh, which is again hard. We were talking before, like when he, when he does score a goal, you go, God, his finishing is amazing there, and then there's, there's five more that he just doesn't doesn't take, just chances he um, doesn't take. It, there's elements of dark days of Michael Owen for me with Morata, where he's yeah. constantly proving his critics wrong by at scoring which, one in four. Yeah, at yeah. which point you're a bit like maybe the critics have a point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, but yeah, Southgate just. It, it comes just comes across so well, I think, and it has synthesised players from you know he's got he's got Leeds United players starting in centre mid. Um, he's not just picked based on on names. He's been able to involve all of them really as well. You know, Grealish as as I think he started one game. Am I right? Mm. But feels like he's been really involved because he's he's created a goal against Germany and and it doesn't feel like he's been snubbed in any way. And the same for for players right through there. You know, Foden starts the first game. I'm sure Foden may have a may have a say at some point in in, in it. You know, he's he's lucky. He's got a lot of um, he's got a lot of talent, but he's used it really well, and he's not stuck to safe options. Um, even though you know his overall approach is quite conservative, he's not afraid to put Bukayo Saka in. He's not afraid to to pick Sancho from from nowhere really. But you know, he haven't really um, featured massively. He's not afraid to pick him in the knockout game. 
and that just I think that transmits that he's got faith in all of them. What what strikes me as interesting about the three teams that I'm saying are, are interesting. Um, Viali, there was the lovely piece that James Horncastle wrote in the Athletic about uh, Viali and Mancini and the long time friendship and the way Viali speaks about the game. You know, it's a sport is not war. It's a game that you play with your mates. Um, and his own uh, struggles with with cancer. You've got within there, as I say, Mancini himself, who's, who's had those sorts of struggles. Southgate. I'll come back to that in a second. The Danes speak obviously around the the Ericsson issue, and there's an emotional warmth to them in the same way that that appears to be with with Mancini and Viali. And within that Southgate, often Philip, I think when people talk about emotion in football, you think it's all screaming and shouting and, and waving your arms and, and and being performative. Southgate to me. What he's done really well, and I would say the same thing as I say about the Danes, about Viali, about Mancini, is that he's he's grabbed emotion as a warmth without making it performative. So when he speaks post match, when he, for instance, spoke of the penalty thing and all of that, to me, there's a real uh, emotional intelligence, a real emotional honesty without, as I say, it being screaming and shouting and pointing or anything like that. And that's what I think those three sides that I have mentioned, that's what they do all have in common. And it strikes me as remarkably 21st century within the field of football that this is a lot of men being exceptionally o- emotionally honest and vulnerable, but simultaneously being able to actually be emotionally strong. I think they're all very measured. Um, I mean, I was saying before we, we came on air that I feel like particularly those three are probably the best teams in the European Championships. And I, I mean that as in this collective togetherness. Um, and I think for for many years with, with England, you've had players from all different clubs who basically are told throughout the careers to hate each other because they're playing for your rivals. And I think it's remarkable really how that's kind of been taken out of this England side for me. Um, You know, you've got what I would class as some fairly big egos in that side, uh, in the likes of Grealish, in the likes of Kane, in the likes of Sterling, who don't come across that way when they play for England. They come across as a collective. Um, And I think it's right, you know, what um, Steve was saying before about the fact that Southgate seems to have managed to get every player that even if they're not playing and they're not part of the squad even on the match day because of this ridiculous rule of you can only have 23 players in your match day squad that even if they're not involved that they're still playing a, a part in it and you know yesterday after the game you know he mentioned you know the players that exactly, haven't even had a exactly walk in yeah. and you know he's saying that they're just as important because of what they're doing for the you know the rest of the players off the pitch you know, galvanising and to be to- totally behind the teammates. You know, there's not none of this fighting of, you know, you've not got Grealish coming out and saying, why am I not playing every game? I'm the best player. Friends in connected squad. to Grealish said. Yeah, yeah exactly. There's, there's none of that. There's none of, um, you, you, there's just no noise around it. And it, it's, to be honest, it's quite heartwarming to see that. Um, you know, we've, for so many times, we've, we've seen all this argument of X, Y and Z should be playing and, you know, why are we trying to shoehorn Skulls, Lampard and Gerrard into a side, you know? And we've we've kind of gone away from the very best players don't actually need to be playing on the pitch, that they can still be involved, they can come on, they can make a difference. And maybe you're right, maybe the, this five substitutes has, has helped with that, um, that you can say, you know, we can start with this solid side and then basically bring somebody on to basically change it and to get them involved Um and I've I've been really impressed with them to be honest. I mean, I, I was slagging him off before the the German game because I just thought he was going too negative, too solid in a way. But it's working. They're very very solid, and it's working. And you know, good luck to him. Yeah, I think I think lots of that's fair. I have to say, you know, you you see after the game last night, Jack Grealish comes out straight away, and he's he's obviously on social media saying, you know, fantastic win for the boys, and he's probably sitting there thinking to himself. Internally, I probably should have featured there somewhere, given what I, I did in the previous game, mm. and he, and he, you know, he didn't. And I think, you know, I'm not. I have to say, I'm not massively excited when I watch England. It's it's not really my bag anymore. Um, I used to be a lot more into it, um, certainly kind of late nineties and stuff. But I'll still watch the games, and you know, some of them are a tough watch. I have to say, I don't always agree with some of the the kind of narrative around the games where they were getting lots of praise early on. But you know, you're getting through the games and you're winning them, so. No, maybe I'm maybe I'm the one who's wrong in this in this instance, um, but I think what he has created, and I think Henderson plays a part in this, you know. And I don't 
just want to bang on about it because it's a Liverpool thing, but a lot of players talk about Henderson, even when he's not playing in the games, just how important he is. And before the tournament, even though we hadn't played, there was absolutely no doubt he was going. The manager was crystal clear, he's going. The players who speak about Jordan Henderson, he is going because it's not just what he does on the pitch. And by the way, what he does on the pitch is fantastic. You see it last night. I think it was more passes than any other midfielder. And he comes on at about 56, 60, something like that. And he gets his goal and he presses and it's forward passing, contrary to what people think. Um, but I think having someone like that who's been there and done it, who's won stuff and is now of a certain age, where he can just say to one or two players, just honestly, don't worry about it. You'll get your moments. Your moment's going to come. There's the five subs thing. You'll get your chance. And it's been proven. You know, before they get, I think again, you know, if you want to give the manager a bit of credit, there was a lot of talk about not playing Sterling from the start because he wasn't in the best of form. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I don't think Sterling's been particularly happy with the season. I think there's been a few things where he said, you know, I've not I've not enjoyed not playing as much as, as what he's been used to. And I wouldn't be surprised if he, he leaves Man City, to be honest, um, for, a, for a new challenge. But he stuck with Sterling because of what he'd done in an England shirt. And he deserves credit for that because the, the shout was to go with the likes of a Foden and the likes of a Grealish because they'd been turning it up for, for large chunks of the season. Um, so he deserves great credit for that. But don't underestimate what the likes of a Jordan Henderson and one or two others are bringing to this England team in terms of off the pitch. I think we could interest Raheem Sterling in an old challenge. Um, I'd, be, I'd be up for that. Um, <laughs> no, I, did, it, I think he's 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 recognised in you know in Sterling that that isn't that he is an elite level talent um, and you know was lucky enough to see his debut for Liverpool. And yeah. I do consider myself to have been lucky to have seen to have seen him play for Liverpool. I think he, he is he, one of the best players I've I've ever seen. Um, every, every age, I've, you know, I've seen him Tactically, play. Tactically, he's so he's so good. He's the best attacker left in the play. tournament. Yeah. yeah, can play. Uh, you know, there was a long time when I was like, he should play centre mid because he just was amazing in, in that position at times for Liverpool when when he sort of drifted in there. But yeah, he's, he is he is sensational, and and you know the manager again. I I feel like he's just immune a little bit to. I get the impression, and I might be totally wrong. He's never particularly engaged with anything in terms of social media, or I think I think Klopp probably is quite similar to this. He's not even really aware that people are, are saying. And, and maybe you know something around the fans not so many fans being there and stuff like that um, helps a little bit he's not really aware that the idea that that you know some, some sections of Middle England were, were ready to, to march on Downing Street if Jack Grealish didn't play um, I just think he's he's gone about his business in a in a way that's just slightly isolated from all that and maybe the situation helps them a little bit that there is sort of a semi-bubble around them um, he's just yeah just been, been really impressive in, in his approach you know and, and Luke Shaw Ahead of Chilwell, I think again, you know, a lot of people. If you if you if you did a vote at the start of the the, um, the tournament, you know, he's got loads of options at right back, but he's 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 gone with with you know with with Walker, who is hard to to argue over. I, I yeah, he's 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 got all his decisions right, and I think you can see it in in the way that someone like Jordan Pickford approaches a game for England. Looks light years ahead, light years compared to what I've seen him how I've seen him approach certain games for Everton. Um, you know, he's all round goalkeeping. Looks really in good order. Um, yeah, so yeah. they're in they're in they're in really good shape. But they're about to come up against the player of the tournament, which is Jocka Mala, uh, <laughs> yeah. who is absolutely unplayable at the moment. It'll be interesting <laughs> to see how they manage to cope with that. Um, and the Danes have a lot of all of that same warmth as well. I feel their victory mm. over Russia still remains the most vital thirty minutes of the tournament in Copenhagen. Uh, it was where the whole thing came alive. I hope you're enjoying it. Last two games uh, and then the final. Are they doing a third, fourth place nonsense. No, no, they they're not. Ah, oh, amazing. Uh, <laughs> another crazy win. Uh, one of the few things that the structure of the tournament might well have got right uh, but the football has been very entertaining indeed it all finishes next week thank you very much indeed to Steve to Ian and to Philippa uh, that has been the Anfield Wrap